Let me get started with these measures that we've seen from Beijing, because in an economy that has tried to deleverage for years, that has a problem with debt, this seems highly unusual. How should this be perceived by somebody in the outside? Well, I think the Chinese economy for uh, facing two sort of dimensions of pressures. Number one, cyclical issues. And after 30 years of strong growth, and growth is slowing down, obviously, when you have a big GDP base, you have a demographic change. Productivity is gradually slowing down. So that makes sense. So you, you do not expand China to go back to 8%, 10% of GDP growth. I think that's the very basic fundamental issues. Uh, but we more also have a structure issues. Structure issues, previous three growth engine is gone, which is infrastructure investments, real estate sector, and exports. You know, real estate, you know, there's an oversupply issue, particularly with demographic change, right? I mean, need to be restructured is a big issue. And infrastructure return is low because we invest too much. Export changes a lot. I mean, I think there's two things. Number one, global growth is low, and also geopolitical risk played a quite important uh, factor. So Chinese export, net exports, no longer mm. become the, the growth engine now. So we have to shift to the new growth engine, So, which is the three new growth engines. Number one is domestic consumption, which will pick up also slowly. But second issue is the digitalization manufacturing. We realize the real strength for Chinese economy is the manufacturing. Chinese manufacturing accounts for roughly 30% of global manufacturing, equivalent mm -hmm. to US, Japan, Germany, and South Korea right. total. So digitalize the manufacturing, make the manufacturing stronger, and with scale is an important issue. The third engine is uh, climate change, mm -hmm. investing more in the uh, carbon neutrality issues. And let's talk a bit about these measures, because we're talking about additional sovereign debt, right? And we're talking about mid-year budget adjustments. That's right. very, very rare. We've seen them when? 2008, 1990s financial yes. crisis in yes. Asia. Yeah. Um, is the Chinese economy that bad? It's not that bad. I think it's a, it's a slowing by nature gravity is, is number one. But number two, we need the stimulus more on the structure base, not sort of an overall general stimulus. So that's the reason I emphasize the structure issues. So we want to make sure the money will goes to this area, not into the real states. Mm. So, so this is very much earmarked the stimulus will gradually get into the real estate sectors where AR technologies, climate change issues. I think that will help. Earlier this year, you also warned that we are seeing China having a very high debt already, right? So is this targeted enough not to compound those issues? That's exactly the point. Because Chinese debt is, is high already, total roughly 280% of GDP. So we cannot big, a huge oversized you know, general stimulus. So got to be the sectorial earmark, the clear structure oriented the stimulus. That's the whole purpose. So the package is not huge or big. But I think the impact will be big because we focus on the climate change issue, renewable energies, and all those battery storages, and all those new sectors will become the new competitiveness sectors for China. Dr. Ju, Stephen Engel here. Great to see you again. You are in New York now, a part of a, a team that is going there to kind of improve, uh, you know, a lot of people hope, uh, relations between China and the United States. There could be a summit coming up between Xi Jinping and Biden in November uh, in San Francisco on the sidelines of APEC. What's your key message? You're a smart guy. You went to Princeton. You went to Johns Hopkins. You went to Fudan Dashi in Shanghai. What's the key message? Well, and uh, first of all, and uh, thank you for the kind words, Steve. Great, great to see you once again. I think I'm here leading a delegate to, to join the, the National Committee on the U.S.-China Relations, so very much is on the people's dialogue, which is amazingly warm and nice when people are coming to together to talk, right? We cover a very broad sense, and uh, from economics you know, to investments, financial insurance, and also including very interesting things, the literature, so arts, and the histories, and we even pair a Chinese delivery worker with an American heavy truck driver. At the end, we found we share a lot of things in common, people. I think the key message is, whatever happens in the end, the China-US, we have to live and work together, and the people. 
We share a lot of things in common. That's the future for all of us. The two nations, though, are clearly strategic competitors. There's a lot of skepticism, whether it's on Capitol Hill or in the, the Biden administration, about China's intentions. We all know about the export controls and the limiting of uh, exports of advanced technologies like chips uh, to China. W what is this going to do? Is this going to be the overhang on the relationship? Because you talked at Summer Davos in Tianjin. I saw your panel. You said... The chip restrictions are going to backfire on the United States. It's going to accelerate China's advancements in chips, and it's going to eventually flood the market with chips and be counterproductive. Uh, I mean, do you, is this the message also you're taking to Commerce Department officials in America? I think the key issue is we'll compete with each other in the same way, but we have to cooperate working together in so many other ways. I think we have to understand these both things. So in the particular in the technology side, then the U.S. will have its own advantages. China will develop its own technology as well. So we'll see, but we still have to work in together. I think that's the key. Take a chip. Chip is such a Big, big supply chains, right? You need uh, so many countries, so many uh, companies involved in the whole supply chain production lines. In that way, nobody can do it by its own. So we still have to work together. But we, we still have to compete with each other and work together, even within the chip sector. I think this is very important. China has gradually developed its own chip technology now, and, but we're still open looking for the cooperation with the U.S. on this side as well.